What is going on, Amazon sellers, arbitrageurs? Uh, it is great to be back for another week of our Wednesday news and, of course, Amazon seller Q&A show. Uh, my name is Chris Grant. I am here with my refulgent co-host, Chris Rasick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, right? Uh, I think it. I think it's a positive uh, adjective too, uh, if I if I recall correctly. <laughs> Wait, that implies not all of them are. Not all of them yeah. have been. I've been very careful not to do anything uh, too bad. You know, but there's only so many adjectives in the English language. Uh, <laughs> you can go to a different uh, language, if I guess. So. Uh, it's glad, I'm glad to have you guys here on a, on a Wednesday. Uh, we do this every single week, and we've got a few pieces of news that uh, we think you'll find interesting. And then, of course, we are here to answer your questions. Uh, so if you've got questions about Amazon, online arbitrage, wholesale, retail arbitrage, whatever it might be, we'd love for you to ask them, and we will offer you some unvarnished feedback uh, on your questions. Uh, so Chris, how's your week been, man? Week's been good. Uh, sales are up. Something shook loose from, uh, whatever funk that I was in. Um, <laughs> I thought for sure I had an account health issue incoming, uh, cause it tends to get a little sluggish right before those things pop up. But, uh, so far so good. Um, I, I do have, I have the next, uh, million dollar idea the next niche the next rich in the niche i like uh, it yeah so we start amazon seller therapy oh okay i have a i have a quick follow-up would we need to get licensed as therapists to be able to offer this or or can it just be man on the street type of therapy no, I think we we set up like a VPN in in the Caribbean or something. Just go rogue and and you know just make up some certification. The uh, FTX there are, uh, of therapy services. Yes, yes. Uh, there are a lot of people that that need to talk to someone, you know, and and get in touch. Uh, you know, they they need to organize their feelings a little bit. Yeah, and I I would imagine. Uh, so GSD is curious. Will it include prescriptions? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's on the pro plan. That's that yeah, you'll have to upgrade. Right. We'll, we'll talk to you offline. As long as yeah, as long as you've got a uh, a uh, pharmacist, uh, and we it's it's not up to us whether that's a licensed pharmacist or a street pharmacist. <laughs> uh, they can get you whatever whatever's prescribed. Uh, so we've got some <laughs> we've got some interesting news pieces. All right. The first one, Chris, are you familiar with a place in Florida called Billionaire's Bunker Island? No, I don't think so. Okay. So this is this is a real place. It's down uh, near or in Miami uh, or something like that. Uh, and I've, I've figured out how this island has to do with Amazon sellers and fee increases. Uh, Jeff Bezos just bought not his first, not his second, but his third <laughs> property on Billionaire Bunkers Island. Uh, it's a $90 million home, all right, uh, on the island. It, 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 he's, he's spent a total of $237 million on homes on this island. I have no idea if they're right next to each other or if he's just feels like he needs one for parties, one for weekends and one for the rest of the week. I don't know. Uh, but this one is, um, I don't know. This one seems like a fixer upper with just six bedrooms, uh, and 12,135 square feet. So mm, I don't know. It. I have no idea if, uh, I have no idea how much dock space he has on this particular home or if it's even got any waterfront to it. Uh, but as of right now, I would imagine, uh, this one is just kind of a throwaway house, but I thought it was interesting that he did grab his third home on the Island, uh, <laughs> just this week. Yeah. Poor guy. I mean, it's, you know, I, I mean, at it's this rough. point you, you got to get seven and, and just have one for each day of the week. Right. 
I would imagine, you know, can you imagine walking into a home that has not been cleaned in the past 24 hours by a professional cleaning service? (laughs) I mean, how disgusting is that? What's Uh, a, what's the girlfriend's name? Lauren Sanchez is her name. And I believe that they might be, uh, engaged now, if I'm not mistaken. I thought so. Yeah. Could you you imagine the fights? Like oh. Lauren just Jeff, what what's wrong? You're in the Tuesday house and it's Thursday, <laughs> right? What, something's bothering you, right? I would I'd love to get a sneak peek at that uh, prenuptial agreement. Uh, I'd be <laughs> very curious to see what's in there. Uh, there are there are some other things, and of course uh, we've got a few people coming in here. Welcome to the Wednesday live with uh, Chris Rasick and myself. Uh, of course, if you have questions. Make sure to ask them in the chat, and we will get to those uh, and answer those for you guys. Uh, the The second thing is I happened to see something from Amazon uh, in the news section of Seller Central earlier today. And, you know, they've always got these webinars that they're running, I don't know, maybe once a quarter or, or maybe once a month. And typically, I just skip right over them. I don't even don't even look at them or anything like that. But this one I thought was really interesting because it said right in the title, uh, get reselling best practices. And so I thought I would bring it up because it is, if you go spend time on the seller forums or spend enough time on social media, you get people telling you, oh, reselling, you can't do that. That's, you know, you're gonna get suspended. They don't accept Walmart receipts. You're you're just you're to, you're you're doing something illegal, uh, and they've spelled it out clearly that they are just fine with resellers, and they're even doing webinars on best practices like matching your products to existing listings, how to apply to sell in restricted categories and brands, and how to suggest edits on a product detail page. They also say that they're going to talk about their automated repricer. Ugh, gross. Uh, and best practices for best practices for featured <laughs> offer placement. Uh, now that's that's actually like useful topics. Yeah, yeah, I thought they were very useful. I doubt that I'm going to sit in. I have sat in on one like this in the past, and it was very, uh, it's very surface level information. Uh, you know, but I mean, it's yeah. it's right there in writing that they're just fine with resellers. So my question to you is, how do we get everyone to actually read what Amazon is putting out and understand that arbitrage is a legitimate form of doing business on Amazon? Do we have to? Uh, no. You know, like, uh, no. because I think that I think the people, you know, going <laughs> asking those questions are, are probably uh, a lot of them are in the seller forums. So. You know, if they have bad information, is is that necessarily a bad thing for us? Not necessarily. And I'll, I <laughs> guess I also do want them to stay in the seller forums. I really don't want that toxicity getting out. Uh, it's yeah. Like we, a, need to, uh, we need to keep keep the segregation. Yeah, absolutely. So other, a couple other big pieces of news, in my opinion. Uh, and you're here for the TA Comeback Tour. Tactical arbitrage, as of today, has gotten rid of their scan minute limits that were put in place. Uh, mm, I know that the, you. Where's have the been, thumbs up? We need right? the, a bubble. I figured out. Did how you get to rid turn of it off. I figured out oh. how to turn it off. Uh, so I know that you have been very vocal with your criticism of that the minutes. Uh, so I want to get your take on what they're doing, uh, this change and, uh, you know, good, bad, ugly. I'm interested in hearing your opinion. Well, it's, it's good. It's, it's great. Um, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's not often do we see a company, um, that, that makes unpopular changes actually listen to their user base and make a change that resembles the original product that they signed up for. And, you know, let, let's be honest, uh, you know, the early adopters of TA absolutely loved it. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you look at the history of TA and, and you know, when it launched, 
it was fantastic and it was beloved you know i i mean it's really a game changer um and and still could be but you know there was that that nobody likes changes you know <laughs> which you know maybe you got that impression by the reaction to all the amazon fees that we just talked about but uh you know what I, I, and i don't it's good overall it's positive overall and and this is where people get unfavorable opinions of me, but, uh, and I'm not intentionally trying to pee in the Cheerios. Mm -hmm. However, um, this is just going back to what it should have been. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was a, it, it's a retraction of a failed experiment, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it earlier because I kind of like, you know, I, I was, I was happy, you know, I saw the changes, you know, I dug into it. Um, I looked at, you know, there's a discount that they're offering for existing subscribers, you know, and I was kind of absorbing everything, you know, once it was actually in place. Um, and, and the little cynical part of me, um, <laughs> well, it's not little, but uh, you know, the, the, the cynical part of me, you know, w was kind of resented all of the exclamation points, mm -hmm. you know? And I said, you know, and I felt that, that contrarian part of me, say you know what let's let's dial this back and and let's make sure we're looking at this for what it really is yeah you know, this is the equivalent of say you, you take a, a family vacation every single year right and say you go on a cruise with all your kids and and you know the whole family every single year your family comes to expect it and it's great and it's an all-inclusive all you can eat all you can drink for the kid or no sorry for the adults uh and then somebody buys the cruise line and they say, Hey, we're going to make some changes. Uh, each person now on the cruise gets uh, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch and a hot dog for dinner and no breakfast. And you got to pay for your drinks. Mm -hmm. um, now for this metaphor to work, you have to assume that either all the cruise lines are owned by one company or you know, maybe there are some like rowboat tours and you can rent a pontoon, you know, but not really a, a, a true, competitor um and you go oh this sucks and you know so you have to sit there and go okay what do i tell my family you know you, you could go other routes you know say hey we could we could ride a train uh we could drive somewhere we don't have to take a cruise uh but we really like the cruises um so you have to you know so you have to decide whether you want the pb and j and a hot dog and and stay in the same location or, or choose an alternative and then the company and says, you know, comes back a little while later and goes, hey, you know what? <laughs> that was a mistake. You know, people are getting sick eating hot dogs. Uh, you know, we're going to roll back the changes and go back to what it was, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Right. <clears throat> but it's not like party time. You're just back to where you were. You're back to where you should have been, you know? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. That does make sense. Uh, I am. I am glad that they've done this. Uh, I think it's, I think it's a step in the right direction. Uh, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm sure things are going to get even better over time. Uh, I can only imagine how difficult it is to, to keep up a software like this. Um, I've never built a software that, that big, so I, I have no idea. And like Ryan says, yeah, I know the downside is you can only run four scans at a time, but the upside is you can yeah. pay for the pro account to, to get 10 scans at a time. Uh, but like Michael says, four scans is 175,000 minutes of scanning every single month, which is, I mean, that's a, that's a massive amount through four scans. If you can run them right. 24 seven, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to take a little bit of a tact that I take with Amazon. Like, let's look at it from their side as well. Uh, you know, server costs, there are costs to running a business. Uh, and you, so one of them is server costs and those prices just keep going up and up and up, especially as, uh, the, your usage gets bigger. So, I mean, I can understand having to have some limitations in place. Uh, it, it just makes sense. Um, so I am, I am very glad I, I told, I told the, the team over there, I said, I said, this was a great move. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, and GSD says here, more and more sites mess with the scans by requiring add to cart to see price every three products. Yeah. And, and you know, that is a, that is a very typical thing for retailers to do. Uh, you know, 
I don't know if it's necessarily just to mess with uh, scanning tools because tactical arbitrage is not the only one. It's not the only one out there. Two, it's not the only way that people are scraping data from websites. You know, I mean, if we if we're honest, Amazon is the largest scraper of retail websites in existence. Uh, that's why you get high price errors and and things like that, as because they're out there checking the prices of every single competitor they can get their hands on. Other stores are doing it too. I guarantee that Target and Walmart and uh, anyone who's running a legitimate large scale retail business is doing the same thing. Um, but I really think that that add to cart to see price, I really think that's just a, uh, you know, that's just a way to get consumers to click through, you know, try to try to get a little, little juice on their products. Yeah. We've got another, we've got another update. Keepa made a really cool addition to the Keepa graph. I know that I, I made a video about this uh, the other day, but I thought we should bring it up here. You know, we know that Amazon has added the uh, sold in the last month estimate that they offer. And it might be 50 plus, maybe it's 100 plus. I've seen 20,000 plus. Uh, and, and that even, those numbers are different for each variation. Well, Keepa has added a line in their graph showing historical uh, sold in the last month data points. So the very when i saw this the very first thing in my mind was well this this started back around august when this data gets to be a little bit deeper say come back to school time say come next q4 we're really mm -hmm. going to be able to very easily see how big of a difference seasonal changes make in velocity right. of products um now i know that the data is an estimate i've heard I've heard mostly good things from private label sellers. Yeah, that's that's pretty much in the ballpark. That's about right. Uh, you know, maybe it's a little less. Uh, you know, maybe it was a little bit more, but it seems about about right. It's what I've heard across the board so far. Um, are you are you pro this update or are you anti this update? Because I've seen it both ways. I've seen some people say this is fantastic. I've seen a couple of people say. Great. Now people are going to know what was the hot seller last year, so they all jump on it next year. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I, I'm not on that viewpoint. That's uh, you know they're anti keepa in general. Then <laughs> like, right. oh. yeah, people are going to know what sells. Like I, th this entire industry is built around <laughs> like trying to figure out what sells, and um, yeah. Now I, I mean it's it's positive overall. You know it's it's. Uh, <clears throat> um, I don't expect it to be super accurate because, you know, this is a, this is information that, that Amazon kept to themselves for a very, very long time, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, I'm, what I am curious about is why they decided to, uh, give us a little bit of it now. Um, you know, what those backroom conversations were, um, my, uh, my question to you is, is, um, what do you think are best practices with this information? I mean, you know, like my knee jerk reaction was, okay, you know, this can now be used once we get used to it. Um, my mind kind of went to like, okay, we can see what the market will tolerate as far as mm -hmm. price ranges, you know, and, and, and what caused it to drop. Cause it does look, looks like 50 units is about the, the smallest. It's about as granular as they get with the data. Yeah. Um, you know, so we can certainly see, market tolerance a little bit easier once we get used to to this data being incorporated but mm -hmm. what what other uses uh, can you see do you is it as big as as people think i i definitely think it's big for seasonality you know if, sure yeah uh when q4 comes along uh you know can we see how much more that uh, you know, that Barbie or that, uh, Power Ranger is going to sell in Q4. Yeah. I think that's huge. You know, how much more, uh, turkey gravy are you going to sell during Thanksgiving? Uh, those are going to be the huge winners. Uh, I do think that if anyone is going out and creating bundles, it could also be kind of a, a good piece of data. If you're looking at the competition and saying, oh, okay, well, 
you know, this item here gets 50 sales per month and this one over here is getting 100. Uh, you know, how can I mimic those, take the best practices from both and maybe create something where I get 100 or 150 sales per month? Um, I, I do like your idea of seeing what the market will tolerate. You know, if something is selling 500 plus a month and then all of a sudden it goes down to 100 because the price went up, uh, I think that is, that's going to be huge you know, because I think you and I are on the same page when it comes to pricing. I know a lot of people are like, don't you dare bring that price down ever. Uh, but I'm of the mindset where if you need to bring the price down uh, because that's what the market requires, then I think it's okay. I mean, would you rather sell 10 units a month of something that makes you ten dollars in profit or would you rather sell a hundred units a month of something that makes you seven dollars and fifty cents a month in profit you know uh so i do think that could be pretty powerful yeah. i i think the way that this could be a huge game changer is if in six months keepa allows us to search this data in something like keep a product finder historically you know, show me the items from last December or show me the items that over the past, you know, three months have gone up, you know, a couple of rungs and are selling faster. Show me the items mm -hmm. that have come down a couple of these estimated sales tiers uh, and let me figure out why. Are, did those prices come right. down because that price went up? Are they discontinued products? And you know, I just want to go search for them or maybe I can find them easily, but I could bring that price down in line with what the market will bear. I think that could be massive. And I've already reached out to Keepa to ask them and ask them to add that uh, feature to Keepa Product Finder. Yeah, if it becomes a data point and Keepa Product Finder, that's show me all the products that have increased in sales, you know, by 20%, you know, which, you know, is, you know, 250 up to to whatever that would be. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th that's a nice data point to be able to search. I do wonder also if, um, <laughs> if collectively maybe the, 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 the ranges, the extremes of the sales estimators mm -hmm. that are out there, you know, I wonder if, if that kind of gets in line because it's, it, it, there's huge differences between, you know, if you're looking at jungle scout versus seller amp versus, you know, uh, you know, Keepa or, or, you know, they, like they're all over the place. Oh yeah. Which, which I mean, I get it. That's not like, it's not data that you can, you, you can gather anywhere. It's not like you can just call up your buddy at, at Amazon and be like, Hey, can you let me know, uh, you know, how many sales this item's getting? <laughs> I mean, you might, right. you might be able to grease the palm of somebody, you know, but you're not probably not going to get enough data points to be able to build a, a truly accurate algorithm. And so I, I am curious what this does to the estimators because they are, they can be way, way off. Um, right. Which, I mean, what a tough job. It, sellers want, sell a lot of sellers, no matter how much you or I, uh, you know, preach on this, that those are estimates just like everything else. A lot of people seem to take that information as gospel, unfortunately, uh, instead of just another data point uh, and then, you know, using their own data from their own sales and things. Um, but I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious how we get people to understand that this, the sales can ebb and flow. I mean, it can ebb and flow between weeks or days, you know, I'm, I would like to know the data, like, is there, are there particular products that sell better on like Thursday and Friday compared to Monday and Tuesday? You know, are, are people buying, uh, I don't know, are people buying more office supplies on Monday and Tuesday and on Thursday and Friday they're, uh, you know, they're buying replacement, uh, cornhole bags. Like, you know, how does that ebb and flow change things? But, <laughs> and what would you do with that data? Exactly. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the the problem is there's there's just such a, a small minority of people that you know would use that data for for anything constructive, you know. Because I like you said that, and I immediately went to those people who are like, I haven't had a sale all morning. You know, <laughs> it's like, 
what does the time of day have to do with anything? You know, like I don't understand that. You know, like just right. your I only refreshing sell products that sell really good after often. one p.m. Yeah, You're like oh man, it's dinner time on the West Coast, man. Whoo, we're about to yeah. we're about to hit. <laughs> So we've got a we've got a couple of questions here. Uh, let's see. So the first one is um, thoughts on manual sourcing. So uh, Chuck, manual sourcing is great, uh, but if you wanted to ask something a little bit more specific about it, would love to dive in a little bit deeper uh, on that. Uh, is there any place I could find a list of reseller friendly sites? No, and. and so here's my opinion, uh, De La Cruz. My opinion is, is you probably don't necessarily want uh, like a publicly available list of reseller friendly websites. Uh, if, if Chris or I made a list of, you know, reseller friendly websites, we could probably get a ton of emails, uh, and a, and a ton of views. But then what would happen is some of those very good sites that will allow you to buy a hundred units of things. Well, one of two things would happen. Number one, all the products on that website would end up not being profitable any longer or, or very minimally profitable. And secondly, uh, you would probably find those websites become less reseller friendly over time because resellers, we do some things on occasion, not everyone, but enough that it makes a difference to businesses. Uh, that make them not want to do business with us, like buying things and then returning them when uh, the prices tank, or you know, buying items, getting ungated, and then returning the items. And we've got a real life example of this in Frontier Co-op. Frontier Co-op has been and and is still a great place to go get ungated. There's probably not a lot of profitable items there to sell on Amazon. However, if you buy products from them and then return them, they now charge a restocking fee on every return. Uh, and I fully believe that's because of resellers buying products and then returning them after they get ungated. Um, yep. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of putting out quality information, quality content to help resellers in the space. This is one of those things where if anybody did it, I'd probably be like, you should probably throttle back because long term, that's not a good thing for resellers. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, oh, I, yeah. I, you know, it's worth, uh, there is um, one tool I know about there, and Chris, you may know about more, but there's a tool called OA Buddy. Um, yes. Dave LaCroix uh, has that. He's a friend of the show. Oh, we, Chris, Chris and I both like him a lot. Um, you can look into that. It's a, a, a database that Dave keeps up with notes um, that he uh, either his experiences with stores or, um, you know, it might be a little crowdsourcing as well. Um, but it's a, a pretty big database. There's a lot of information in that. And it'll it'll tell you what happens. You know, I, like I see it, um, you know, every order's canceled or, you know. Mm -hmm got six put, orders in a row to go through or whatever it may be. Yeah. And then you can put in your own notes too, which is helpful to me because I always yep. forget. I always forget the site that I, I, there's a couple of sites where I'll get a lead or I'll, I'll find a product and I forget that I've been blocked. <laughs> like I can't, I can't get an order <laughs> right. through to save my life. And so I go yeah. look and I'm like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I put the note in there. I'm blocked. Yeah. <clears throat> Look at the cosmetic companies. Like I can't keep those straight. Like I, yeah, I finally had to start putting the notes in and cause I, I don't know. I, I bang my head against the wall with, with tart too often. It's like, I oh, yeah. just hurt. Remember to put a note in. So you stop wasting so much time. Kat Von D has hurt me so bad. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, Gina, you look bright eyed and bushy tailed for someone who just completed over 40 hours of live training during the OA challenge. Uh, you know, I, other than, other than a little bit of a scratchy voice, I, I love, I love doing that stuff. So I'm happy. Was she to talking it. to you or me? I was there too. That's true. Chris, Chris was there. Uh, I don't, I don't I'm looking at my, I don't, I don't think bright eyed and bushy tail. So I, <laughs> she must not be talking about me. Uh, just read an email from Amazon about the stickerless program, which is, I think is only in the U S isn't this just another way to have issued issues with commingled inventory. 
In my opinion, yes. Any time that Amazon wants you to send in stuff without uh, your own FN SKU, I I think it's just a uh, it's just a recipe for disaster. And I don't know. Maybe it's because I was hurt very early on by Amazon uh, from the commingled inventory. Um, now th my very first shipment, uh, I sent in a brand new board game. Someone got a, a used one, but I just commingled. I didn't know any better, I, and I didn't have a, an F any FN SKU labels, uh, and so they of course they complained. But this was back when you could like reach out to the customer, and they still got the emails and uh, and answered them. And it was all still kind of novel. Uh, you know, so I was able to get that figured out, but, um, uh, ever since then I said, never again, I will never let you hurt me again, Amazon, at least not in the same way. There's been, a, there's been other ways. <laughs> right. You'll find new ways. <laughs> uh, many sites offer an email sign up discount. Do you ever sign up more than once with a different email address or is that a quick way to get order cancellations? What do you think, Chris? Um, I've never really had a string of additional emails. Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually, uh, my energy was more focused on finding new coupon codes. Um, you know, that I've talked to, we've mentioned that multiple times, you know, the ROI on finding extra coupon codes and, and, you know, that are trying to find sources for them. Um, mm -hmm. it's really, I found some really, really good ones. Um, so it's, that's not really, and and usually, the welcome offer is typically 10%. smaller than, yeah, ten yeah. maybe fifteen. You know when, you know you could you could pretty much find twenty percent off at a, at a pretty regular clip. You know yeah. if you know where to look. Yeah, I I actually I looked at a product just today, and the email the email sign up offer was ten percent, uh, and. It, with a, I mean, with a Google search, the very first result on Google was a 15% coupon code. Uh, couldn't right. find anything, anything more, but they were not stackable. You know, it was one coupon code per order. Um, you know, and now I don't have to go in and, and type in, you know, 30 different email addresses and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah. I know people that do it. I mean, if we want to talk about the ethics of it, I don't know, probably a, probably a gray area. You know, it's not, it's definitely not what it's meant for, uh, you know, that it's meant to get one customer's email address at a time and be able to send sales emails to one person. Um, you know, but is it a victimless crime because they've baked that 10% into their <laughs> margins, obviously, probably. Um, but like Chris said, I do think your time is better spent finding better coupon codes. Uh, Tyler's got an interesting question. What if Amazon shows 1,000 bought in the last month, but then Keepa looks horrible and doesn't show anywhere near that? So I'm going to guess that what you mean is that the bestseller rank uh, maybe doesn't look too great uh, if it's got that, or maybe the bestseller rank, maybe the BSR is missing. Um, in that case, I don't know. I'd have to take a look at it, but my opinion would be if Amazon is stating that a thousand were bought in the past month and Keepa looks really bad, I'd probably buy a few and test it. Um, because chances are a lot of other people are going to get analysis paralysis instead of pulling the trigger on a, a quick test buy. And they're probably going to skip right over it. And maybe you find uh, a diamond in the rough. Yeah. I definitely lean towards the information provided from Amazon because yeah. you, like you have that example of the Crocs that has three drops or, you know, 50 drops a month or some, or I forget how many, but it's ranked like three in shoes. Like it's, it's just flying off the shelf. So I wonder if this new data in Keepa will get people to stop teaching that drops equal sales. What are you serious? Is that on equal sales? <laughs> If if this does nothing else but get people who just give out bad information like that, I I will be so happy. <laughs> Keep a drops equal sales and arbitrage is dead. So what does it all mean? Uh, so uh, I I don't know how to pronounce for so I'm just going to call you Tyson. Uh, but afternoon, gentlemen. When an item does not have a buy box and you come in with a price 
the market prefers more, which then generates a buy box. This lowers the rank and velocity. From a customer's perspective, does Amazon just show the item more as the rank lowers and velocity speeds up? Just curious of the mechanics of how this works. Oh, Lex, that makes it much easier. Um, so <clears throat> this is the way that any marketplace is going to work when when something converts better. So let's say, I don't know, let's say you have, uh, you, you search in bottled water and you have a, a, you know, you have Fiji water right next to, um, I don't know, what's another brand? Uh, Mountain Spring. Valley, okay? Uh, you have these two bottles of water next to each other. Uh, Amazon is probably going to push up the one that converts better because their whole job is to get people to buy products. Uh, and so whichever one is converting better, they're going to show more. So if it's got a buy box and it's selling through and it's selling through faster, then yeah, they're going to end up showing it a little bit more often. Um, and, but part of the reason that the rank gets lowered is because the friction for the customer gets to be less, you know, it's amazing how much one extra click will lower your conversion rate as people there's a lot, I mean, well, let's be honest. Not everyone uh, is is coloring with a, with a full deck of, of crayons, okay? And they open up a, a product detail page and they don't see that yellow buy it now button or add to cart button and they have no idea, I, I can't buy the product. Why can I see it, but I can't buy it? Uh, and then you've got enough people who still buy the product, but when that little buy box returns and, and they're shown the product, you know, they're able to click through it. So all of those things kind of work in favor to increase the, the rank and velocity and all that. Oh, this is great news. Luke says, uh, OA Buddy's great. Accidentally didn't follow their advice recently. Had a cancellation. Uh, and as soon as he followed the quantity recommendation from OA Buddy, the order went through. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's nice to have that information. It's... Uh, it, but it's not gospel, right? Um, I was just talking about this in the mastermind. Um, there was well, it, it, Sephora, right? It, I know in the mastermind, I remember somebody telling us in one of the meetings, you know, a year or two ago that Sephora, they don't care. They're reseller friendly, fire away as much and as often as you want based on their quantity limits. Um, and then I just on a whim, I checked OA Buddy and it said something like they cancel every one of my orders. Mm -hmm. you know so you know so that could cause some confusion i mean you under, i understand and and i'm not nothing negative against oa buddy you know i like it um i like the tool a lot um yeah but be you know be cognizant of how many data points you're getting from oa buddy and and you know definitely sprinkle in your own personal uh experience yeah so. um Oh, you know what? So let's answer this question. And then uh, we've got no, one other piece of news. So uh, Mario's curious, do people still use tactical arbitrage? Is it still worthwhile? Um, I know that people are probably going to think that I'm biased. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to let you <laughs> handle this one. Uh, Mario Luigi, if that is your real name, um, I, uh, people, yes, people still use tactical arbitrage. Um, I never stopped. Um, is it still worthwhile? That that's that's a tough question. Um, if you're if you haven't been using it and you need to expand your sourcing horizons, um, it, yeah, it's absolutely worth it. Uh, you know, the the a lot of the negativity with with tactical arbitrage was one. You know, like uh, objectively, they devalued the program, right? Um, and that's a fact. And, and I think it's confirmed by the fact that they rolled everything back now. Um, so I don't think they, uh, anybody would be mad at me for saying that. Um, and, and, but I think what happened, a lot of the negativity was um, the people that need Amazon seller therapy. Uh, you know, it, it's, they were longtime users. So it's, it's difficult. Uh, and, and if you, you kind of let it, if you let emotion get, get the better of you, you know, you kind of have a lot of negative feelings and, and you're seeing it with the fees. You know, you have all these people like, oh, this is it. The beginning of the end. 
you know, they're pushing third party sellers out, you know, but which is which is right next to you. You'd have that up on one screen on Twitter, you know, like arbitrage is dead. And then on the other screen, you could have 63 percent of Amazon sales come from third party sellers. Those things mm -hmm. are, are, you know, coexisting at the same time. Right. So you have to you have to take the emotion out of it. Um, so is it still worthwhile? I, you know, I mean, with the changes now, it's, it's worth trying it again. If, if, I mean, it sounds like you're asking that question because you might be considering it. So, um, you can run, they change things. You can run four scans at a time and have three in the queue. Um, but we're back to the environment to where you could have scans running all the time. Um, mm -hmm. that's going to change. I never, I never stopped using it because it's still generated far more profits than the cost, you know, and I have a system in place and I learned how to manage the scan minutes as much as I didn't like it. Um, but I still used it. It still generated thousands of dollars in profit for me every single month. So it was worth the 79 or, you know, with whatever discount I still had from Alex days. Um, but I changed things. So now I'm going to be able to go back to product. Cause I actually turned, I actually became a hundred percent reverse sourcing or mm -hmm. reverse searches. Um, just because, you know, that was, that was my sweet spot. You know, I, I like the searches. I like the results. You know, I like the, uh, the amount of results that I got and I could kind of, that's how I learned to manage my scan minutes. So, but now product searches and, and store searches are back on the menu, you know, cause yeah. you better believe I'm going to have four running every, all the time, 24 seven now that I'm allowed oh, to. Again. Good. Yeah. I mean, you find a, you find a good sale. You go in and you throw throw tactical arbitrage on it. Let it let it grab all the the low hanging fruit. Uh, yep. You know, plus you pick some of the sites that people aren't searching. I mean, come on, that data yeah. that data about ten of the ten sites out of the four or five hundred that are in that are supported in the U.S. Ten of them are where like eighty two or eighty five percent of the scans are being run. That's insane. Mm -hmm. There is so yeah. much opportunity that's not getting touched out there uh, that that alone should make you want to use it. I mean, and I know I, I'm an affiliate, you know, I'm a shill, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I, I told I told them, I said, I said, this change alone is going to make me start making tactical arbitrage content again, because there one, there's so much opportunity. Uh, and two, now that people can run scans all the time. Uh, it's going to be a huge money maker, uh, and if you know how to use it, the ROI on it should be pretty high, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, and that data of you know how many dark corners there are that aren't getting scanned with scan minutes, you couldn't use it. You yeah. know now you can. You know yeah. I I basically converted to a, a an automated storefront stalking uh, process with exactly. the scan minutes, but you know I'm not handcuffed by that anymore. Yeah. So Gina also has a tactical arbitrage uh, question. Uh, got an email about the pro program. You understand that old accounts will be grandfathered. So that means your current account, if you have a tactical arbitrage account, your price is not going to change, but you are going to be limited to four concurrent scans at a time. The pro program opens it up so that you can do 10 scans at one time. So it's completely up to you. If I would imagine that four is probably going to be plenty for most people. Uh, that pro plan is going to be something that, you know, for the people who are absolutely hammering tactical arbitrages is, is what they're going to need. Uh, Bowtide Mutt, uh, having pretty constant issues with Amazon shipment discrepancies. Any tips to reduce that? Um, man, I don't know. It, it, Fight I, I'll be honest, this kind of seems cyclical. It seems like sometimes you just get, you know, these these strings of bad luck. Uh, here's my opinion. Rather than, rather than worry about your inbound shipping, as long as you're doing things right, you know, long as you're doing everything by the book, uh, just add, add a couple of things to your process. Maybe, uh, maybe take pictures of packed boxes that show what's in the boxes. Maybe make sure you're getting, uh, receipts from UPS for the pickups showing the weight, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. That way you have more information to send them to get reimbursed on the discrepancies. Um, other than that, I, I'm just not sure there's really anything else you can do. Is, do you, is anything you can think of? 
Uh, did you say printing off uh, packing slips? Yep, printing off packing slips. That's another helpful one. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't think this would necessarily be helpful. But when we were doing our own prep, uh, of course, we were. You know, we were doing two D. You know, but we'd also print off two copies of the packing slips. One goes right inside the box, uh, and then we kept mm-hmm. one as well. Yeah, you know, we didn't print off that second one. It got got saved to a, a Google Drive folder, but uh, yeah. you know that way you can send that in to show them that it's you know what's been in the box. Outside of that, get a get a service or a VA to handle the shipment discrepancies. That way, it feels like less of you pounding your head against a brick wall. Yeah, but it is definitely happening. They're absolutely right. I I've, I never had any, uh, you know, in over four years straight with zero issues, and now I've gotten twelve in the last ninety days. Yeah. So, can you write a book but. on Keepa, uh, beginner to advanced principles? Uh, you know, I've been tempted, uh, but that seems like a lot of work. Um, <laughs> When it comes to sneakers, what's the best way to determine uh, that this particular variation is good? My opinion is, is that you need to use the variation uh, um, like checker inside of Keepa. That's the best way to do it. Uh, you know, see the recency and frequency of reviews. Uh, see how much the number of sellers is kind of going up and down. Make sure to compare that to how old that particular variation is. Because if you're on if you're on a listing, for example, that is six thousand days old, uh, and the the variation you're looking at is seventy or a hundred days old, and it has less than one percent of the reviews, but the recency and frequency is going up, chances are that one actually probably sells really well. Um, so make sure to check check all of that. It'll it'll help a ton. And it's it might be worth uh, it you might know this already, but, you know, getting used to common shoe sizes, mm-hmm. you know, you, you kind of consider that if it's a, you know, women's 14, um, you know, and, and you're not really sure. And, and the, the data has got you about 50, 50 chances are there aren't a lot of those, you know, yeah. unless you're selling to the WNBA or something. Right. And, and remember, I know that the next question will be, well, how do I find the most common shoe sizes? It really is just a Google search away. Uh, you'll be able to get a list of, you know, and percentages of what the most common sizes are. Uh, and you can actually check inside of category insights in seller central, and they will tell you what the most sold sizes are for any particular category, which that can be super helpful. Uh, Luke, who moderates OA buddy? That's our friend, Dave LaCroix, a fellow Floridian. Uh, and yeah, I, I believe they do accept submissions. You might have to hit them up on Instagram or something. Um, I can't remember. I just saw it somewhere. He had a statement that said, Hey, if you have any input or, you know, additional information there, there is an email address assigned to that sort of thing. Yeah. Or it may be a catch all. I don't, I don't know if it's specific for updates. And if you, if you actually, if you click on the OA buddy extension, you can click support. uh, And there's a, um, there's a little button there that says contact OA buddy support. If you send them in there, I know Dave, Dave is a good businessman, uh, not just a good seller. He's just, he's a good businessman. Uh, and he'll make sure that he gets that. Oh, before we go to this question, uh, there's one more piece of news I wanted to share. We released an update to IP alert today. Uh, one that I'm, I'm a bit proud of. Uh, so, Chris and I have talked about Keep a Product Finder a ton. Uh, in, in the OA Challenge, we spend a whole day on Keep a Well, actually, we spent two days on Keep a Product Finder this time around. Uh, and we added in the ability for IP Alert to have the data right inside of Keep a Product Finder. So if you go in and are using Keep a Product Finder and, and then the product viewer, uh, the, in the brand column, you will see a green check mark or a red siren that lets you know whether or not the item is known to get IP complaints uh, or, if, or if we <laughs> you know, do not know. Of course, it's just a data point. It's not gospel. Okay. Uh, and then we also added in, uh, in the ASIN column, if the item is multiple, since that 
comes up in five days. Meltable uh, season is no longer in five days from now. Uh, you'll see a little ice cream cone that shows that the item is meltable so you can stay away from those or realize that you'll have to merch and fulfill those only. Um, I put a video out on YouTube, Twitter, uh, and all the other social media sites showing that update. Uh, but I was, it took us two times to figure out how to get that to work. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that one. Yeah. So it's all right. So we, I saw the video, but I didn't watch it cause I, I love you, but I'm sick of looking at you after the OA challenge. I get it. And, I get it. You know, so, uh, <laughs> so, you and my walk, wife. so you're saying, <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. Um, so it's, it, so in keep a product finder, you know, say you get your, so you get your results, right? You've got mm -hmm. all those ASINs. It's, it's, you're saying it's in there. Yep. You'll get an alert yeah, in that, in that list of 5,000 ASINs that you can pull up. If you look in the yeah. brand column, you'll see a green check mark by the brand, or you'll see a red alert by the brand. So you know whether or not there's an IP complaint problem or not. Man, that is, that's pretty slick. How'd you pull that off? Got it. Uh, uh, I thought, I thought those limeys were a little, little, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, a little sketchy about that stuff. So I am of, I'm of the opinion that it is better to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. <laughs> uh, so if they reach out and they're like, Hey, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is not okay. Uh, I would, I would walk that back, but I'm such a small fish compared to keep. I figure they're probably not going to notice it anyway. Um, so <laughs> that's cool. That, that's a really good feature. All right. So do you guys use ASIN Gadget, Rev ROI, or both? Uh, if familiar, is ASIN Gadget Pro worth the money or does the free version offer enough? Um, well, I mean, I, I have ASIN Gadget Pro and Rev ROI. I'm a, I'm a tool collector. So, you know, take that, take what I say with a grain of salt. I do think that ASIN Gadget Pro has some features that are very worthwhile. In my opinion, one of my favorite features, it seems simple, but the ability to check Trustpilot uh, and the who is information on every website alone pays for it without me having to go and open up those sites. Uh, but I can also download, uh, you know, information uh, like ASINs. I can download some Keepa data, some historical seller data, uh, and all that stuff to run through other programs like Tactical Arbitrage or take them over to Keepa uh, and run like a a pretty massive um, storefront stocking uh, in there. So in my opinion, it is worth it. Rev ROI doesn't cost you a penny. So you should probably go get that too. All right. Uh, if a customer returns an FBA product and they damage the item, can I get reimbursed? I tried a case with Amazon and they denied reimbursement. Amazon Terms of Service state that you are not able to get reimbursed for a customer damaged item. You are now in the retail business and returns of damaged items are, are part of, it's just part of the business. Uh, if the item is not the same, you know, so they buy a pair of shoes from you and then they return their old shoes that are all grass stained and stuff, you might be able to get reimbursed for that. Uh, but if they just, you know, bought an item, uh, damaged it and returned it. No, you're not going to get reimbursed for that. Unfortunately. Uh, let's see here. Sorry. We got a bunch more questions here. Ah, would you guys sell a brand that you have received a suspected IP complaint, but it was removed. I believe I got the complaint because the listing was a general listing as the brand and not the actual <laughs> listing. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to need to read between the lines a little bit here. Uh, I think, I think maybe the, the listing was generic, uh, and now it is actually, uh, listed as the brand. If it has been done properly and fixed, it would probably be okay. Um, but you gotta be really careful and make sure that it's not, it's no longer generic. Uh, otherwise you get yourself in some trouble there. Um, I've been selling a product in which Amazon just gated. Now they're asking for 1D or 2D codes because it's a transparency enabled product. Any advice? They're asking for five transparency serial numbers. 
So you're going to have to get them. Now, and these are not things that you can print out at home on your own and put on your product. These are things that you need to uh, you need to go in and you need to, it actually needs to be there from the manufacturer. Uh, and so you'll have, you probably have to order more, hope it has the, the codes on there and send them in pictures of those. Let's see. Sorry, I need to run through these because I, I didn't realize it's almost six o'clock already. Uh, is there a see, but we got, there's no OA challenge, so we, we don't have a hard stop though, right? Right. Uh, is there a difference between closing a listing and deleting a listing? Um, closing a listing just means it's taken out of your inventory. When you click the close and delete, it sends a note to Amazon to say, hey, you can go ahead and delete this from the catalog. Um, they won't do that if there are other sellers on it. So is there is there a difference? Yes, but does it matter which one you choose? Not really. I just always choose close and delete. Uh, a customer returned someone else's product. It was FBA, where do I go to try to get a refund? Uh, you're going to want to open a case with seller support. Um... As one of the kings of Keepa, who are your favorite sellers when it comes to learning about new ways of using and thinking about Keepa and KPF? Um, I think that you, Saul, the mirror, the buy box. <laughs> are you going to say the mirror, Chris? I was, I was not. I, I do not have the uh, <laughs> the ego to to say that. Uh, but Saul of the buy box has a, a pretty great mind for KPF uh, and Keepa. I think Chris has a great mind for Keepa and KPF as well. Um, outside of that, I, just, I I can't say that there's someone who I'm like, yeah, that's that's who I go to to learn learn about it from. Uh, a lot of it really is just trial and error, in, in my opinion. Oh, nice. Luke says he just realized he can pull up uh, his store in Keepa to see if he has any meltables. That's great. Oh, yeah. That's a great idea. Uh, let's see. I received two complaints that I was selling counterfeit products. I had only one of each product and bought it TJ Maxx. Do I just acknowledge? And if so, does it still affect my account health? So here's something about account health. It, whether you acknowledge it, whether you you know get it retracted, it's always there. You've got a permanent file at Amazon. They they can see that stuff. Okay. My opinion is, is that you should try to get it retracted. Go to TJ Maxx, find the item again, get a picture of it next to the receipt. If they don't have any in stock, talk to the manager, ask if they can pull it up in their inventory management system, take a picture of that next to the receipt and really paint a story for, uh, for account health and try to get it removed. Uh, worst case scenario, acknowledge it. It will go away, but it's still there, kind of in the in the background. Um, but I, I would I would try to fight it. Yeah, I don't know. The hair stands up at the back of my neck just thinking about acknowledging that I'm selling a counterfeit product. Like, right? <laughs> I, I I'm not sure what the what the end number of how many times I would try to fight that over and over again. Exactly. Now I I'm not going to say it unless you want to. I know that there's a store that you like to source. Uh, that uses a, a skew on their price stickers like TJ Maxx, like a Ross. Uh, you take pictures of, of every single one? Not every single one. Um, okay. Just, you know, I, I should. I know I should. Um, but some stuff feels safe and mm -hmm. some stuff has that IP alert feel to it, even though, yeah. uh, you know, the, the alert doesn't come up. You know, so... I, I kind of go by feel, which could certainly burn me at some point in time. Um, yeah, I would agree. And tell you what, we've got a great, Chris and I are recording a podcast tomorrow. Uh, I had to clear my schedule to make sure we have enough time. Uh, but we're going to go in depth on on this uh, and process for uh, like keeping account health clean and stuff like that from a an eight-figure retail arbitrage seller. I'm stoked for tomorrow. That's going to be, it's going to be a ton yeah. of fun. Um, yep. let's see here. So we're going to answer two more questions and then, uh, we're going to bounce cause I do have another meeting to get to, but, 
Uh, sorry if you guys mention it, but how bad do you guys think the low inventory fee is going to be for arbitrage when we only buy two or three? You know, I was thinking about doing a poll and seeing uh, and showing people where they can find their low level inventory items in their account uh, and then seeing how many uh, are actually low level inventory, uh, you know, mm -hmm. so that'd be my opinion and sorry. Flash is absolutely, he's, he's taken off at it, someone. Like UPS yeah. and Amazon must be there at the same time or something, right? Actually, that sounds like a FedEx bark. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my opinion is it's going to be less of a deal than many people are making it out to be. Uh, now, for private label sellers, for... Uh, you know, maybe for some people who are doing brand direct wholesale, it's probably going to be more of an issue, but I think for the listings where you're competing with 10 other sellers, I just, I have a feeling that it's not going to be quite as bad as people think. Uh, and fortunately they delayed the implementation of actually charging you for the month of April so that you can see what the, the fees are going to be. So I look forward to... Yeah. I'm either going to eat crow because, and I told people I would, I'd eat crow if I was wrong, or I'm going to be vindicated. Uh, and I, I hope that other people are going to be like, oh yeah, they were right about this not being such a horrible thing. <laughs> am I, am I hoping for too much? No, I don't. I mean, I, it, the arbitrage is dead. People think you are, but, uh, <laughs> you know, like, it's a, so, such a sensitive topic, though, isn't it? It is. It is. I'm gonna. I am gonna make a post tomorrow, and it's gonna. Uh, I'm gonna give the instructions on where to find all of the data, and then I am gonna take a poll. You know, is it less than ten percent of your products? Is it you know between ten and twenty percent? I'll, I'll take a poll and I'll share the results. Um, hopefully, the data set will be large enough I could share them by Friday. Uh, I just don't know if it will be. I might have to share them next week, um, but. We'll, we'll do that. Um, yeah. Guys, we've been going for an hour, and uh, this is only supposed to go for like 35 minutes. Uh, so I <laughs> uh, appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, and, At least we're on uh, brand. <laughs> right. Uh, see, here, Chris. Only 17 SKUs affected by low inventory fee out of over 1,000. It's exactly it what I'm expecting for arbitrage sellers. So inbound placement yeah. fees, they suck. But what are you going to do about it? Uh, the low level inventory fees, I really don't think they're going to be that big of a deal. Uh, these, uh, the return processing fee, it sucks. I really don't think it's going to be that big of a deal unless you're no good at prepping, uh, your products, uh, you know, and you get, you get a, a, an inordinate amount of returns. Um, uh, yeah, but anyway. All right, guys, that's it for us. Uh, we'll be back. Chris and myself will be back next week to do this again with you guys. And in the meantime, we'll have a podcast out uh, from a family who does eight figures in retail arbitrage. Not once, not twice, but like four years in a row uh, they've done this. So you guys are really going to enjoy that one. So have a great one, everybody. See you next week.